not to be great. Okay, okay. At least. So can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. So just you share your PPT, we can check whether everything is fine. Uh, sorry, can you repeat because you're uh, there's a lot of noise the power, in the line. The PowerPoint that you want to present, can you upload there? You yeah. go to the right top button, the beside leave there is a share content. Um, yeah, I'll try. So what best is that you can open the PPT file in the desktop and then you can share, then you can control your mouse. That will be better actually. I have very great trouble hearing you. This is a lot, of, the connection is really poor. Okay, okay, okay. I connect this one. Uh, can you hear me better? Looks he has some internet problem.
Hello, Sisbren. Yeah, this is a lot better. Good. Okay. 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 Nice. Nice. No, okay. sorry to give you a scare. Can you try and share the screen? Yes, you can share your screen. Another experienced Teams user, I think Zoom and a lot of platforms I'm using, but not Teams so much. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yes, the, uh, okay, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the, oops. Um, yeah, this you just minimize this uh, right down this um, teams. Yeah, we just minimize. There is some way it's coming. So yeah, this is a, this is all right like this. Ah, uh, this you just minimize this right down. This one is coming. The small window. Ah, yeah. this. Uh, okay, now it is fine. Now it is fine. Okay, perfect. And Good. It, okay, now now just you move your slide. We will check everything is fine or not. Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, okay, nice. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Good, good. Technology okay. works. Quite a relief. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So we have also put this lecture in YouTube, so so that more viewers can see YouTube live, and we'll see some questions from the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess if there, how is the discussion going to go? Um, people just yeah, speak, so, or yeah, so they, they, that I will coordinate here. Uh, Microsoft team, the people will ask who are in the Microsoft team, and uh -huh. from the YouTube chat, that I can uh, coordinate so that I can uh, read their question if they have any. Okay, you, can you take care of this. Perfect, yes, yes, yes. So you do a lot of these lectures these days, like this, I yes, guess, we are, like everyone yes, else. We are doing, <laughs> yes, we are doing a lot of lectures. And maybe, yeah, November, this is the last, uh, we'll not do any more in December. So let's see. Of the situation will improve. Uh -huh. the labs. So and how, is, how are the labs, are, they, uh, are, are people working in the labs right now? In India? Yes, yes, now, yes. Uh, actually, students were, they went to home for six months and now they are coming, they are seniority wise. So, fifth year, fourth year, they are back. Uh, yeah, so they, uh, even students are, are returning to lectures or is teaching done remotely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the only the research scholars has come actually. The other BTEC, MSc students, they are. Uh, we have the online class. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> Although we did uh, do the exams at least in person. That was uh, uh, last year. We didn't do this, but uh, this term, uh, this is, this has been done, and that's an improvement because I think examination is particularly difficult. Uh, to do this mm. all, uh, online in a way that nobody cheats, it's almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is the biggest challenge. <laughs> yeah. Because if you give the same question to them, they will uh, cheat. They will talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, so one of my colleagues did a very, very clever thing. He actually, well, it's a lot of work, but he prepared two exams with very similar but subtly different questions. So you could immediately tell whether people had collaborated on the question because uh, then you, they would give the answer to the wrong, say, question, and that would then also almost uh, um, that would then immediately be evidence if, uh, that they had been cheating. So, and that was quite revealing, actually, <laughs> that exercise. Ah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, here we have uh, some of the faculty is using one software. So all students, you can see their video, how they are answering. Right. So yeah. that way uh, you can control a little bit. Yeah, that will help a lot. I think our university decided uh, that, that this was somehow violating some privacy rules. I don't quite understand because if you're in a lecture hall, people can look at you too. So why not buy a camera at your home? But that will... Apparently, they didn't want to go down that route because, uh, yeah. but not doing that then basically means it's, uh, it becomes very difficult to check anything. And you had come earlier in India anytime or no? I was in Bangalore um, several years ago. I don't even recall how many. Um, that, well, yeah, no, a long time ago. Um, uh, which was fun, um, uh, but that was the only time. Okay, okay. Hope you will visit sometimes later. <laughs> yeah, I think nobody visits anywhere right now. It's even uh, even traveling within the country is uh, is, is really. Uh, no, they try to our government told people to uh, even though I think they're formally allowed to travel to some countries, to also not leave the country for Christmas holidays. So. And, Let's see how many people obey, but uh, for the moment, it's um, yeah, things are are tightening up a bit. Uh -huh. Okay, so it is already six four now. So thank you all of you, and good evening to all of you. And it is in, uh, after lunch time in Netherlands. Indeed. So. <laughs> I just introduce uh, Professor Sijbiran Otto, and uh, uh, he has quite excellent background, and he is one of the pioneers of the systems chemistry. So he was born in 1971, received his MSc and PhD degrees, uh, come loaded from the University of Groningen in Netherlands. Also, he worked on physical organic chemistry in aqua solutions in the group of Professor Jan VFN. In Bumps. Then he moved to United States for a year as a postdoctoral researcher to work with Professor Stephen L. Reagan, Lake University, Pennsylvania. In 1999, he received a Marie Curie Fellowship and moved to the University of Cambridge, UK, where he worked for two years with Professor Jeremy K. M. Sanders on dynamic combinatorial libraries. And he started his independent research career in 2001 as a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Cambridge in UK and accepted an appointment as Assistant Professor at the University of Groningen in 2009 and was promoted to Associate Professor in 2011 and Full Professor in 2016. He directed the Chemistry MSc degree program at the University of Groningen from 2014 to 2019 and he got ERC starting grant in 2010 and advanced grant in 2017 and VC grant from NWO in Netherlands. Also, he is one of the six main investigators on the prestigious National Gravitation Program on Functional Molecular Systems, 26 million euro over 10 years, 2013 to 2023. He is the joint editor-in-chief of the relaunched Journal of Systems Chemistry and had chaired cost action CM1304 on the subjects of system chemistry, uniting more than 95 European research group. He is the chair of the 2022 Gordon Research Conference on System Chemistry. And he also got many awards. So I just tell two awards. 2018, he got Royal Society of Chemistry Supramolecular Chemistry Award. And 2020, he elected to the Royal Dutch Academy of Science. With this, I like to welcome Professor Otto for his talk on the ultimate challenge in system chemistry, the synthesis of life. Thanks, so Subhas. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give a lecture in these challenging times. Uh, fortunately, not in real person, in person, but uh, but at least uh, online. This this is now also possible these days, which is uh, which is a good. Uh, Thing that this this can still take place and uh, it does save you time in in in, uh, in queues in airports so there is there's always every cloud has a silver lining thing and uh, people say right so the the work we're doing um, is motivated by 
one of the really grand challenges in science, and that is the synthesis of life. So can we make life as chemists in a flask? Um, and that, um, of course, is a, I will immediately uh, sort of quench expectations a little bit. We haven't quite succeeded yet, but I think the, 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 the idea of synthesizing life um, sets you a lot of challenges and makes you think about a lot of things uh, that uh, I, I'll try and convince you uh, are giving rise to useful science. And I think the prospect of, the, of synthetic life is also really um, a possibility. The question is within what time frame, but I think it's not something that is science fiction any longer. Right, our um, motivation to start work in this area came from uh, more general considerations about complexity and about emergent behavior. So if you look around you pretty much anywhere, um, if you see systems where individual entities are interacting, uh, like, for example, people in a society, this gives rise to behavior at the systems level that is really uh, very different from anything that occurs in the individual level. Um, so that applies to society and all the, its, uh, its, uh, its dynamics. It applies at a smaller length scale to neurons that connect through neural network, eventually giving rise to a brain. And, um, we all know what a brain can do. Um, and again, you wouldn't have been able to predict it even if you knew everything about an individual neuron. Uh, so there's a lot of properties that emerge at systems level, um, also at cellular level, and I would argue also at chemical level. So if you start making networks of molecules, networks of reactions out of relatively simple uh, components like molecules, then at the aggregate level, at the systems level, all kinds of properties arise um, that are new, that are emergent. And one of the most stunning of these properties is without any doubt life. Uh, so life at the end is just a bag full of chemicals doing really complicated things together uh, that give rise to behavior that is very hard to even um, trace back to uh, to the individual chemicals and understand what the role of the individual chemicals and reaction networks is. So that's the whole of biochemistry, right? That's trying to decipher this. Now, I'm uh, I'm a chemist, um, and as chemists, um, what you like to do is to create things. And I think systems chemistry is a really exciting uh, field in this regard because um, once you learn how these networks work and what how they behave and how you can build them to show properties at systems level, there's an awful lot of new stuff to be developed, to be discovered and to be made. And the ultimate challenge there when it comes to new behavior is of course, as I mentioned already, uh, the idea of life and making life. Uh, so this is really a big question. Um, it's different, so the question, can we make life, is different from the question, how did life start? And I guess a lot of people, uh, a lot of chemists also have gravitated towards this question here. Fewer people address the question of, can we make life? Of course, the two are intimately related. Um, if we understand how we can make life, we also learn a lot more about how life might have started. Uh, but my, uh, the focus of my talk will be less on how life might have started um, and more on how we can make life and not necessarily life that looks like the biochemistry uh, that we're familiar with, uh, but it may as well use completely different principles or different implement chemical implementation. So how do you go about a challenge like this? Um, well, Science tends to be reductionist in most of its approaches, um, even though this is kind of counter to the philosophy in systems chemistry, you can take a reductionist approach to life and see what aspect it, aspects it contains. And if you do that, then you arrive and you sort of try to curve up um, life into little pieces, little components, uh, then there are three main pillars uh, which are generally believed life rests on. One is the ability to replicate, so any living creature is able to make new other living creatures. Um, those creatures tend to be contained somehow, separated from the environment. A cell is a cell membrane. Um, 
life also is able to metabolize. It's able to take up material and energy from its environment and use it to basically propagate. Um, and so these three things need to come together and need to be integrated, functionally integrated, uh, if you're to develop a synthetic form of life. Um, and the functional integration um, needs to be such that the system is maintained out of equilibrium. It's also a really important aspect. Life is not an equilibrium state. Um, it is something that is actually rather, relatively far away from it, and it needs a continuous input of energy uh, to, main, to maintain itself and to propagate. And in the course of propagation, it's also able to evolve. Uh, so Darwinian evolution has given rise to all the varied life forms as we now see them around us. Um, and that then back to the question, can we do Darwinian evolution but in a purely chemical system where molecules replicate and somehow metabolize are contained in a compartment? We can also think of, incur of sort of molecular um, implementations of these concepts um, the challenge is to bring all of this together. But once you succeed in that, you get close to something that you could call a life. Whether it's similar to life as we now know it, certainly in its simplest incarnation, it won't be, I'm sure. Whether everybody would recognize something that contains all of this as being alive, um, I also doubt it will be probably a discussion. Some people will agree, some people will disagree. Um, but I think it's a worthy endeavor to try and see how far you can push this integration. And what I'll talk about today is, is our journey in this direction. And, uh, and, and uh, I'll update you on where we are uh, on the big scheme that I showed on this slide. So our interest in this area started with a surprise finding a surprise discovery of self-replicating molecules. We were not looking for them, we were not even thinking about the, the, the synthesis of life uh, at all when we were, um, doing, we were doing experiments at the time, but we by accident ran into self-replicating molecules. And I'll show you in a minute how they work. And from there on, all the rest I'm going to talk about um, kind of um, followed. Uh, once you find a system of self-replicators, you, you see how far you can push it and how far you can get it to show all these different types of behavior that you also need before something is alive. So here's a little animation that shows how uh, the self-replicating molecules form and work. Uh, so our experiment started with a relatively simple building block, a single molecule, um, uh, lots of copies of an identical molecules that can react with uh, copies of themselves by forming oligomers, in, in, particularly, in particular in this case rings. The reaction that connects the building blocks together to rings is a reversible one. So you see exchange of material happening between different rings um, all the time. So you get initially an, a, a mixture that is exchanging material between different rings. So you could argue these different rings uh, equilibrate. Now you just saw two of these rings coming together and start to stack and form a self-assembled structure. Now, in the, by assembling, it stabilizes the ring that's part of the assembly, and it pulls the equilibrium over to form more of the ring that does the assembly. Initially, this is a, um, a linear growth process, up to the point that you start agitating the mixtures. And the moment you agitate these growing uh, these uh, these mixtures with long, thin fibers in them, the fibers start breaking. And the moment a fiber breaks, the number of fiber ends doubles. And the growth rate of the fiber then also doubles. Um, so you end up with a system where you, you start from one fiber, and then you, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. So you end up with an exponential uh, growth of the ring that makes the stack. So it's assembly-driven self-replication of the rings that are able to assemble. So only those rings uh, replicate and the other ones that remain free in solution uh, that have a different ring size eventually all convert into this one ring size that makes the stack. So just that you, so that you get the, uh, the picture here because the rest of my talk kind of builds on this. Um, I've summarized what you just saw on the animation on the single slide. Um, so we start off with a building block and I'll show you the structure in a minute. Uh, that can form rings. Uh, initially, it's just, it, it forms relatively small rings, maybe a little bit, uh, a small amount of also larger ones, but the, the equilibrium tends to lie on the side of the small rings. 
Um, and then within that ring mixture, you get a nucleation of a particular ring size. Um, the nucle nucleus elongates, and when it becomes long enough that it's susceptible to mechanical energy, you enter uh, an elongation fragmentation cycle where you autocatalytically form more of the fibers and more of the rings that make up the fibers. So the structure that we worked on and the system that we worked on when we discovered this um, was uh, this peptide-derived thiophile building block. So there are two thiol units here that in the presence of oxygen from the air can oxidize to give rise to disulfides. And so that makes, so the, the yellow rings here are uh, held together by disulfide bonds. I'll show it on the next slide. And the blue bit here is a bit of peptide that was designed to assemble into beta sheets, but it's too short to do this by itself. So you normally need a longer peptide if you want a beta sheet. And the idea there is that if it's too short to, to assemble by itself, by the time you start stitching a bunch of these building blocks together in a ring, you get now a sufficient number, a sufficiently multivalent structure that assembly becomes feasible beyond the critical ring size. Um, and typically what we see is that the, the, the smallest ring where assembly is feasible is the one that does do the assembly and, and then enters this autocatalytic uh, growth cycle. So just to recap the chemistry, um, diethyl, as I said, in the presence of oxygen from the air, um, you can oxidize the system to disulfides, and while you have some thiol left, there's also an exchange between the disulfides uh, going on, so you get an equilibrating mixture of these different rings in the beginning. Um, now, if you monitor such mixture over time, um, you get something like this. So this is uh, analysis of the composition when we start off with only the monomer, um, and we monitor in the course of a month what happens. So initially, the monomer oxidizes, giving rise to small rings predominantly three and four membered rings. And then for this particular case, uh, after about three weeks, you see this rather sudden emergence of a seven membered ring. Um, in, and this, this type of kinetic profile suggests it's autocatalytic. There is a, a big lag phase and then an exponential growth of the seven membered ring. If you want to prove that this is autocatalytic, what you do is you take the um, a system at an early time point before any a significant amount of the uh, the autocatalyst has uh, has emerged. So say about after after about seven days or so, and then you take some of the autocatalysts and you add it at that point. And if it's an autocatalyst at that point, the rate of of its growth should increase a lot. And this is indeed what happens. So if you add the seed at this point here, you see immediately growth of the growth of the heptamer shoots off, whereas in the absence of it, it takes uh, much longer before it finally starts to grow decently. So it's autocatalytic. So we've recently also looked at the growth of these fibers uh, by, uh, by real-time AFM. Um, so this is sped up 60 times. So here you can see uh, by scanning uh, with an AFM probe very rapidly, and continuously, uh, the system, while it's submerged in a solution of, uh, of, of, say, food molecules, you see the fibers and you see the fibers growing. So we're pretty excited um, to actually see this. It's, uh, it's the first example of uh, seeing self-replication um, directly. And we were also very intrigued by what we saw because we saw something we hadn't realized was happening, despite that this was 10 years uh, down the line, 10 years since we first discovered our self-replicating molecule. So if you look, so this is a, a looped uh, um, video. If you, look, if you look what happens at the point of the arrow, so you see here is a fiber growing. And at some point here, you see now it grows kind of stops, you see um, material, material arriving at this site here. It's a little blob of material and then travels along the fiber. And if it gets close enough to the fiber end, then the fiber continues to grow again. So this suggests a mechanism where um, there is a fiber that recruits material from solution from which it grows, uh, allows the diffusion of this material along the fiber uh, site, and when it gets close enough to the fiber end, then you see that the fiber indeed elongates. So I showed you one video. We've done a lot of these AFM uh, experiments. When I, see, when I say we, uh, this is mostly the work by a countryman of yours, Surav Maiti. 
uh, who works in the uh, in the group of uh, Wouter Roos, with whom we collaborate um, uh, on this on this project. So they're presiding over the the high speed AFM instrument um, that is uh, pretty state of the art and allows you to do these uh, real time experiments. Um, so the cool thing is they revealed a new mechanism for self replication, and you can probably generalize this out as a new mechanism of self-assembly or uh, where self-assembly is guided by the assembly itself. Uh, what do I mean with this? Well, ordinarily, if you want to do supramolecular polymerization, um, so 1D self-assembly, you have a, a, a search problem by the time you start making very long things. There's only very few ends of the fibers and your material from which the ends, uh, that, that from which the supramolecular polymer grows somehow needs to find these ends. And that's a three-dimensional search problem. It sits there in solution and it needs to find the end. And this can be a slow process. Um, if you have a fiber that is able to recruit material to its site, finding the site of a fiber, particularly with long fibers, is a lot easier than finding the end of a fiber. And once it's found the site, if it then is guided towards the fiber end, then the whole assembly process uh, becomes a lot more efficient. So a 3D search problem is uh, converted into a 1D search problem and the whole assembly uh, becomes faster. Um, so it remain, will remain to be established how general this mechanism is, but I suspect we'll see it also in systems that are that are different from, from ours and that are more sort of straightforward supramolecular polymerization processes. Um, so they, it, it's especially important when uh, fiber assembly cannot occur by insertion. So if insertion is possible, of course, you don't need this guide in, guiding to the fiber end. But if insertion is difficult, then, uh, then this guided assembly mechanism um, may well turn out to be uh, rather important. OK, but that was a little, uh, a little aside, a little uh, foray into supermolecular polymerization. Now let's return to the problem at hand, the synthesis of life. I spoke about replication. Let's now progress towards the other aspects that we would like to integrate. And the next on our list, uh, the next one that I would like to discuss is the, the idea of Darwinian evolution. So Darwinian evolution needs mutation, uh, needs replication, of course, but that's not enough. It needs replicators to mutate and it needs a selection among the different mutants uh, for the one that is most fit in the given conditions that you run the experiment in. So how can you implement this in, in, in the system of ours? Well, the mutation aspect is not too difficult. We work with a peptide building block, so you can easily introduce different peptide building blocks into the system. So the system has a choice as to which one it incorporates and in principle mutate its replicator. Uh, the replicator in principle mutate from one to uh, from one type of um, peptide to another. Um, so this was our original peptide. Um, I showed you that it can make seven mer. I didn't show you, um, there's an interesting James Bond connotation here, but I didn't show you that if you put a, that if you shake rather than stir the system, you make a, a six mer. If you want to know more, uh, this is our, our original publication now back in 2010. So uh, please excuse me if I don't dwell on this for, for much longer, uh, but instead go to what different peptide sequences do. So we played around with the peptide sequence, mostly with this residue here. And if you convert that into somewhat more hydrophobic residue, you make another replicator. And this time you lose the 7 mer and only make 6 mer. Make it more hydrophobic still, you go to 5 mer or even 3 or 4 membered rings that are making the replicator. So there seems to be a trend, more hydrophobic, smaller ring size. So what if you make it more hydrophilic? Well, indeed, if you uh, get rid of uh, some of the greasy, greasy bits here, uh, or even put an OH group, you arrive at an uh, octamer replicator. So there seems to be a trend that as the strength of the peptide-peptide interactions uh, increases, and strength of peptide-peptide interactions can increase by increasing of hydrophobic interactions, so the, the more greasy residue um, uh, make for stronger peptide-peptide interactions in water. Um, so as the strength of the peptide-peptide interaction increases, the ring size of the replicator that emerges decreases. So please remember this trend as the glue that holds the peptides together gets stronger, uh, you already get replication with the smaller ring size. And this is perfectly consistent with the idea of multivalency. If the glue is weak, you need a lot of it. 
if the glue is strong, you need only little uh, and already are able to make a stack. Um, I'll come back to this, uh, this trend later in a different context. So oh, if we now know that different building blocks give rise to different self-replicating molecules, different assemblies, um, if we are to enable mutations, we need to provide the system with more than one building block, obviously. If there's only one, there's no choice. If there's two, it can in principle choose to mutate to another and incorporate another peptide building block. So we started playing, and we're still doing this, with mostly binary mixtures, where we mix two building blocks together. And I'll show you now, I think, two or three examples of, uh, of the behavior that we encounter when we do this. Um, and this is, in all cases, behavior that you normally kind of don't see so much with chemical systems and that you're more familiar to meet in the area of biology. But we still see sort of biology-like, life-like phenomena occurring in purely synthetic chemical systems now. Um, so I'll show you three examples. This is the first. Here we mixed um, a serine and a phenylalanine building block. The serine by itself, I showed you in the previous slide, wants to make octamer replicator. The phenylalanine prefers hexamer replicator. And the question, for which we didn't have an answer uh, when we started the experiment, is then what happens if you mix the two? Well, what happens then is you in the, the well, you have an analytical challenge to start with. Um, so you start need, you, you will need to set, be able to separate all the different mixed rings that you can make. And this is uh, a, a slide that shows that we've become pretty good at doing that. Um, so this is a UPLC trace. Okay, it's a long UPLC trace, um, but it shows baseline separation of most of the components in this mixture that you get when you mix S and F building blocks together. So the two building blocks, S, and where's F? Must be somewhere. Um, ah, there it is. Uh, F and then all the different rings that the two, uh, two make. So to simplify it a bit, um, here are the six-membered rings that it can make, um, ranging from S6 to F S5 and so on, all the way to F6. And you see they're very well separated, even though there's only a single amino acid uh, difference between uh, between the between each step in this uh, in this little ladder. So we can separate, can analyze. That's good. So now we're uh, good to go and find out what really happens uh, in these uh, in these systems. So there's a work by Ankush, another uh, so an Indian PhD student uh, in the group. Um, so what happens is. If you mix S and F together, that you first get a set of replicators that is hexamers and rich in F6 and F5S, F4S2, F3S3, but not more than that. So you get these four mutants coexisting, and then nothing happens for a little while. So this here is the time axis until there's a second family of mutants emerging, a second set of replicators that are now rich in these S in the remaining serine containing building block. So you see here something that's reminiscent of, uh, of speciation as you see it in, in biology where you've got one set of replicators and then another set of replicators that it branches off the first and the I say it's reminiscent um, and it is because there's a cross catalytic relationship. So these guys here don't emerge out of themselves they're, exist, they're, uh, they're helped into existence by the previously already uh, emerged, emerged set of replicators. So these guys emerge spontaneously, and then they help the formation of another set of mutants a little bit later. So conclusion here is we see replica replicators spontaneously diversify and specialize on different food sources. So this guy, these guys prefer to eat the F food source, and these guys prefer to eat the S food source. So if you like, this is almost like partitioning into niches, as you see in, in ecology. OK, second example of another type of behavior that emerges when we mix two building boxes, when we mix this guy here, um, which has a glycine spacer, like all the other examples I showed you before, with a slight variant of it, which has one more carbon in the spacer here. Um, so that's a beta amine. Um, spacer. So the only thing difference between these two guys is one more CH2 group. This one by itself, I showed you before, gives the octamer replicators. 
this one has a hard time doing anything. So eventually, if you wait very long, you do get a little bit of hexamer replicator. What now happens if the two mix? Well, the title already gives it away. You see, you start to see parasitic behavior. So the first thing that happens when the two uh, uh, replicators, the, the things are, are together, you have the, um, the octamer replicator by the first building block. Um, but then after a while, uh, no, but then this octamer replicator can cross catalyze the formation of a hexamer um, that, is, that contains the other building block that is by itself really reluctant to give rise to replication uh, replicators, but now it's helped into existence by the octamer. But it's rather ungrateful. The hexamer replicator then pulls material out of the octamer and uses it to make more of itself. Um, so this is really a case of parasitism, um, even almost predation in the sense that it's it attacks the uh, the guy that that gave rise to to it, and used the components of it to build more of itself. So again, behavior you're familiar with from biology, not necessarily from chemistry. Final example: uh, what can happen uh, is also somewhat odd in in uh, to see in chemistry, and that is stochasticity. So here we mix these two building blocks together in a one-to-one -one ratio. We do this in a single vial, and we then divide the content of that single vial over 10 separate vials, which we try to treat in as much as we can exactly the same way. What happens then is we get um, either hexamers or octamers or both emerging out of these vials. Um, so by the time we mix, there's no replicator, and by the time we give it some time, we see the emergence of replicators, but they differ, their composition differs markedly. So here's, here's some pie charts that show the, uh, the hexamers in blue and the octamers in green, and you see that we get a lot, that the, the results, even though the experiment was conducted in, in as much as we could in identical matter, the results vary a lot. Uh, so stochasticity, another thing we know is important in evolution, but we don't see often in chemistry. Uh, what happen, why this happens here is most likely because we're, we're dealing with a, a, a nucleation event that basically dictates the fate of the sample. So whichever ring size, hexamer or octamer is nucleating first is the one that tends to dominate uh, throughout and, and pulls all the material towards itself. So it's the stochasticity of nucleation um, that, uh, that seems to drive this. And to an extent, we are familiar with that idea, stochasticity of nucleation. Of course, you get uh, also in crystallization, and when you have different crystal polymorphs, uh, this can be a real, sometimes a real pain, even if you're certainly if you're working in the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Um, so I showed you a bit about what can happen um, when you want to achieve Darwinian evolution. I didn't show you evolution yet. I'll come back to this. But in order to do Darwinian evolution, we first need to um, look at another aspect, namely the art of equilibrium uh, part of the system. So Darwinian evolution cannot occur at equilibrium. It needs a continuous process of replication, or it needs two processes to, to work um, in the, on the system, replication, but also destruction or death. Um, so we need, if we want to do Darwinian evolution and if we want to start to mimic life, we need a replication destruction regime, just like life and death is, are, are essential to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the living process. Um, so what I've showed you so far were replicators, maybe two replicators uh, in the same system or only one, um, that convert food into more of themselves. So that in itself is not enough for evolution. If you want to evolve, you want to be out of equilibrium. This, this system on itself will just go to equilibrium, will make the lowest energy state and will stay there. If you want to keep it out of equilibrium, you want to allow, want to allow things to evolve, you need to introduce an element of death. You need to introduce turnover of material between the living and the, or the replicating and the, and the, the non-replicating state. Um, the simplest uh, implementation of this is to continuously add food and continuously destroy or, if you like, remove material from the sample and the removal then access the death. A somewhat more elegant way of doing this, if you don't remove, but you recycle. 
um, material back to food. So if you have a process, if you have concurrent processes of formation of replicator out of food and destruction of replicator back into food in a fueled way, in an energy driven way, then you're in the regime you want to be in the replication destruction regime that is uh, that is uh, driven by an input of energy. So I'll show you two implementations of replication destruction regimes. One somewhat less elegant, which is just a, a CSTR, a continuously stirred tank reactor setup, where we flow in the, the 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 food molecules and we flow out some of the sample, which where the outflow then uh, basically is the is the the death process. And since outflow is pretty much indiscriminate, death also here is not really um, a selective. So any replicator in the vial has an equal probability of being flown out in any uh, any uh, time slot. So in this experiment, we start off with octamer replicator. And now I want to remind you of the, uh, the correlation we saw before uh, between the strength of the peptide-peptide interactions and the ring size of the replicator. So before we play with the peptide sequence to influence the strength of peptide peptide interactions, but we can also play with the environment uh, to tune peptide peptide interactions. And in particular, trifluoroethanol was known from the literature of protein folding to be a very good solvent if we are to promote secondary structure formation, to promote beta sheet formation between the peptides. So adding trifluoroethanol should lead to stronger beta sheets, and therefore should push uh, or should favor. Uh, selectively the smaller ring replicator. So we start off with a large eight ring replicator, and then we're going to introduce trifluoroethanol and see what happens to the system in this replication destruction regime. Do we see it adapt to its uh, to a change in environment? And indeed we do. So we started off with octamer. Um, this is time, this is composition, and in blue in the background you see the trifluoroethanol content. You started off at 50% trifluoroethanol, the octamer has a hard time, um, or actually it withers away and the hexamer takes over, uh, as we predicted based on the effect of trifluoroethanol on, on beta sheet formation. By the time the hexamer has, has taken over, we uh, basically flow out uh, the trifluoroethanol. We do this by now providing food uh, in pure water, so gradually the system, uh, is, the trifluoroethanol is flushed out of the system, and then we see that the hexamer disappears again and gives rise, gives rise back to the octamer. Um, we've also shown in separate experiments that hexamer and octamer are cross-catalytic. So they're each other's mutants. One can catalyze the other and vice versa. Um, so we now have a system where there are two mutant replicators and where a change in the environment selects either one or the other. So with that, we really did um, show, or did, we, we ticked the boxes that you need to tick in order to be able to do Darwinian evolution, replication, mutation between two, two different ring sizes, and selection. Now, you could argue, and I would agree with you, uh, that yes, this may be Darwinian evolution, but it doesn't really go uh, impress you by um, inventing anything. You just alternate between one or another ring size. And indeed, in this system, the, the structural space to evolve, to evolve into is extremely limited. We just have a few different ring sizes that the system can access, and that's it. Um, so now, in order to push this further, uh, and, and these are experiments that are currently underway, we need to provide more different building blocks, offer different opportunities, uh, different to to make different structures, and see if we can still play similar games. Then, and hopefully, then the system is able to invent. Uh, new functions and evolution is able to become open-ended. But this is a real big challenge and maybe even the biggest challenge, the biggest hurdle to take if we are to develop uh, life de novo. But I'll say more about that later. So this kind of, so the idea of open-ended evolution the, that resonates with the idea of complexification. So we know if we rewind the tape of life as far as we can, that life started simple and became more and more complex. It started with unicellular organisms, multicellular organisms arose, and then um, so gradually, um, and maybe not so gradual, but in steps, things became more complex. And that raises some fundamental questions. How does complexification happen? What has driven it? Um, and if you 
start to address the idea, the idea of complexification um, with self-replicating molecules, you immediately run into a problem. Self-replicating molecules tend to be fast um, when they're simple. Um, and um, if you have, if, so if you compare a simple replicator with a more complex replicator, the complex replicator usually is slower to replicate because it has more work to do, it has more information to, uh, to, to copy. Um, so this leads to a, this leads to a, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's a switch of my phone, apologies. Normally you get very cross with the audience when they have mobile phones, but I guess uh, now it's uh, uh, you're uh, you can get cross with me, right? Fix this off. Okay. Um, apologies. So we're dealing with a question: simple versus complex replicator. Simple replicators tend to be fast, complex replicators slower because it just takes time to copy more information. Simple replicators are thermodynamically therefore also a little bit more stable because the, than the complex replicators because they're, by containing more information, have a higher entropy. Um, so how do you then transition from something simple, which you're likely to start off with, to something more complex? Um, the answer there is again in the out of equilibrium aspect of life. So you can imagine if you have a precursor from which a simple or a complex replicator um, forms, uh, that they both compete for the precursor. Um, in the process of replication, the simple one has an advantage over the complex one. Um, but if you still want the complex one to win, maybe um, a solution to the problem is to have the complex one be more resilient towards destruction. And being more complex, it might also uh, ha have the ability to do this um, better than, than, a, than a more simple one. Um, and if that's the case, then you can still escape from the rule of thermodynamics um, and complexify against basically the, the drive towards maximum entropy, um, but fueled by this replication destruction regime. Does that work? Can that happen? Well, I'll show you now in a very, again, very simple example that this is indeed possible. Uh, so we implemented the replication destruction regime um, where we indeed recycle now the material. It's no longer an inflow outflow system. It's now a system which is, um, is continuously supplied with an oxidant that converts building blocks to replicator and the reductant that does the reverse. Um, so what happens in this system? We have thiol being converted to disulfides and being, um, um, re, uh, being broken down again to thiol. Uh, this happens by an oxidant and this happens by a reductant. So continuous supply of these two species um, then should let this uh, go around in a circle. Now you might wonder if you add oxidant and reductant, don't you have a, like a short circuiting here where the, the two guys react with each other and they ignore the replicators? In principle, this could happen, but the trick is to have rather a lot more replicator than you have stationary states of oxidant and reductant so that the reaction uh, goes through the replicators and the building blocks rather than uh, directly. So then you can have, uh, then you can, with that regime, you can start populating a replicator that is both slow and thermodynamically unstable compared to its competitor. So this is, say, our energy landscape. We now have a single building block to start off with. We have two different replicators. This guy is small, that guy is larger, so you could argue this is more complex. Um, we have interesting debate with one of the three reviewers who, um, who, uh, who, who doesn't entirely agree with us here. Um, so this system these building blocks um, can go here or there, but the barrier towards going to the smaller replicator is lower, so it's faster to form this replicator than to form that one. Um, and also this one is more thermodynamically stable than that one. So now normally, if the only thing you do is make replicators, uh, you have no chance of making any of this or, or, or very much of this. Um, so it will go here. 
But if you now combine this uh, with this formation process with a destruction process that is fueled, you are allowed to return to the building block stage. And what's key here, you're allowed to return to the building block stage through a different pathway than you went than you arrived at the replicator. So you introduce another path for destruction. The fact that it goes through a different pathway is because you add reagents uh, because the formation of replicator out of building block is coupled to the um, the reduction of an oxidant, where the uh, return pathway is coupled to the oxidation of a reductant. And these two are different species, and therefore you you, you have different pathways. Uh, so what the, what happens at the end is you still go very fast and form this replicator, but you also go very fast back to the building block. And once every now and again. You have a slow process that takes you to the more complex replicator. And once you're there, you're there for much longer. And the destruction process is much slower, uh, allowing material to accumulate here. So here, by chemicals so at the bottom line here, is that by chemical fueling with oxidant and reductant, you're now able to populate a more complex replicator um, and make that win the competition for building block from a more simple replicator that is both faster and thermodynamically more stable. Uh, but still, that's not enough to win. It's the resilience to destruction that gives the competitive edge uh, to this guy here. OK, so let's now go to, um, so we looked at replication. We looked at out of equilibrium aspects. I showed you Darwinian evolution, at least in the rudimentary sense. Let's now look at metabolism. And this touches on uh, on a fundamental uh, question. In order to metabolize, you need to learn how to catalyze reactions. So if you're a replicator, you catalyze your own formation, that's good, but you need to do more. You need to also be able to catalyze other reactions than your own formation, uh, reactions on molecules that you find in your environment, and you want to turn them to molecules that, you, that are useful to you. How can that happen? How can replicators invent catalysis? I think this is a key question in, in, in the course of evolution. That, um, uh, and it leads on to maybe a broader, more broad question. How do replicators invent anything? Uh, what are mechanisms for invention in evolution? Um, and there is a, an interesting one, if you look at biology, that operates there a lot. And that's called co-option. Uh, so let me explain that by an example of how feathers evolved on a, on, a, on on birds to or dinosaurs at the time, or some, some little uh, uh, cousins of the dinosaurs at the time. Um, so feathers are good things to fly with, um, but in order to fly, you need a long feather, and you can't get a long feather in evolution uh, in one go. It always has to be a gradual process. And short feathers don't serve you very well in fur flight. So the theory has it that feathers were co-opted for flight, but invented, not the right word, um, but evolved to solve another problem. Uh, feathers evolved uh, probably initially as down to solve a temperature control problem that the cold-blooded uh, dinosaurs had. Um, so down, small little feathers, help you there, and if they grow a little bit bigger and you fall out of a tree, they turn out to give you a competitive edge over your fellow um, uh, creatures that, uh, that don't have as long feathers. So that's where then the evolution kicked in and co-opted the feathers that were initially for temperature control to, to be used for a completely different purpose. So can we do something like this? Can we see something like this, this, co this idea of co-option also in systems of self-replicators? And it turned out that indeed our, the replicators that we developed were able to catalyze reactions um, by, and this invention went pretty much through the, this, this mechanism of co-option. So remember that the peptide assembly here was needed to make um, replication happen because it's the assembly process that drives the replication of the ring that makes the assembly. Um, so replication results then in a uh, or in a, the organization of peptides into a beta sheet. And it turned out that more or less by chance, doing that then sets these peptides up nicely to do catalysis. So let me show you what catalysis they can do. 
I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, so they've developed more or less at the same time uh, in the lab. This is really an exciting uh, one or two years uh, that we've had uh, discovering that the things that we worked on without any further alterations being required, uh, the replicators we worked on without having to change our structure, were able to catalyze uh, a bunch of different reactions. The first one we tried was this retroaldo reaction, um, which is uh, was known from the protein uh, designer protein field to be a very uh, good reaction if you have lysines in hydrophobic pockets. And um, if you look at our building block structure, it has lysines, and by the time they start to assemble into beta sheets, uh, they are quite likely to reside in hydrophobic pockets. Um, so what happens if you now do an experiment where you take the building block of the replicator with the substrate of this retro deals all the reaction? So that's the only stuff that present at the start of the experiment. And you then run it and see what happens. So the graph here shows on the y-axis the replicator concentration in blue, or on the other y-axis the rate of this retroaldo reaction in red. And you see that as time progresses, after about 10 hours, you see the emergence of a replicator made upon oxidation of this diphyl building block. And the time that that starts to emerge coincides with the time that the rate of the retroaldo reaction suddenly picks up. So it looks like the replicator, but not any of its precursors, are able to catalyze this retroaldo reaction. Uh, so, sorry, the retroaldo reaction. The reason it's able to catalyze it um, is that these lysines um, can, can make an, uh, an enamine uh, type, uh, sorry, an aminium type structure um, with the substrate um, that then activates it for uh, deprotonation and elimination uh, to give this enamine uh, inter uh, intermediate, which hydrolyzes uh, rapidly to liberate again the catalyst and, uh, and, the, and the ketone. And this system now, the fibers are particularly good at catalyzing this reaction because they form a substrate binding site that are the hydrophobic pockets between the beta sheets. The lysine pKa is altered by about three p, uh, pH, uh, three pKa units from what it is ordinarily in solution. So at p, even at pH seven, you still have a lot of not protonated lysines, which you need to do this reaction. Um, the other thing we realized when we did the kinetic analysis, which surprised us, is that less than 10% and far less than 10% of the lysines are actually active in this. So this suggests that the, um, the system has um, basically, uh, a lot of, it, it's pretty heterogeneous, so only a few of the sites on the fiber are actually catalytically active. Um, but the activity of those sites is as good as the best designer enzymes that have been developed for this reaction, and that is without us trying to optimize anything here. So that's one example, um, and it's interesting to show that, uh, to, to note also that this um, um, remember this from a previous slide, that the more complex of these two replicators is also a better catalyst uh, for this uh, retroaldo uh, reaction. So in this case, the hexamer is the better catalyst. It shows that complexification here also um, is linked to functional uh, improvement. But you could argue, okay, you can catalyze a reaction, um, but the reaction you're catalyzing doesn't help the replication process in any way. And you'd be right. Uh, so can we also do catalysis where the catalysis does something that helps the replicator replicate faster? Turns out we can, and actually in two different ways. Show you the first now. Um, so the idea there is you not only, so let's go back one. So this scheme here shows the basic scheme of self-replication. To reiterate, building block gets converted to small rings, and the small rings in an autocatalytic way form the large ring stacks. Can those large ring stacks, can those replicators now do a reaction that enhances, for instance, the rate of oxidation, the conversion of the building block into the small rings? If so, then it should promote uh, the amount, the formation of food that it needs to replicate from. And you could argue this is a the first step into a metabolism, which is why we called it proto-metabolism. Uh, it turns out this is possible in an indirect way. Um, so the reaction, so the replicators, uh, apart from doing the retroaldo reaction, they can also cleave FMOC groups of amino acids, remarkably efficiently, by the way. 
Um, we're currently looking at the extent to which we can even use the system in as a synthetic, um, uh, as in, in a way that's synthetically useful to deprotect FMOP groups under neutral conditions. Normally, you need base, uh, so it works really works a treat. So this deprotects the FMOP group, liberating the amino acids and liberating also dibenzofulvine. And it turns out dibenzofulvine is able to promote the rate of oxidation of thiols to disulfides and thereby enhances the formation of food, enhances the rate of replication. Um, just to convince you that that's the case, I'll do that on the next slide. Let me first tell you wh why the system is so good. It is so good because it has two amines, one not protonated and one protonated. The, not, the unprotonated amine, like you would do with an ordinary FMOC protection, takes away the proton, starts off the, uh, sets off the elimination, um, and the protonated amine uh, uh, acts as a proton source to uh, facilitate leaving group departure uh, by protonating the, uh, the amine here. And this all happens um, probably on the same fiber, whether it's the same two amines of the same peptide or adjacent peptides is something we don't know, but we do know we need two amines uh, to do this. Um, so, that's shown you now some 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 uh, some key kinetic data. Um, so if you run an experiment, again, what we do is we take the building block of the replicator and the substrate at the beginning. Those are the only two things present at the start. And then after some time, the replicator emerges. And at that point, the moment the replicator emerges, we see that the substrate, which is in, in blue here, starts to uh, diminish. So catalysis starts as soon as replicator emerges. The, second exper the same experiment, we also monitored the rate of oxidation. So you see here um, uh, an experiment that was conducted as a control without FMOC lysine. You see the rate of oxidation is as it normally is when you have uh, oxygen from the air present to oxidize the, di the tiles. Uh, but if you put FMOC lysine, the replicator, as soon as it forms, which happens around about here, it starts to liberate dibenzofulvine, which starts to enhance the uh, oxidation of thiols. And you indeed see this reflected in the speed of, oxi uh, of oxidation being uh, picked up. Um, and then finally, that oxi faster oxidation is also translated into faster replication because there's more material to replicate from. Um, and that's shown in this experiment here. Uh, again, exactly the same experiment, but now we're monitoring um, the amount of uh, replicator that grows when we have FMOC lysine compared to when we don't. So when we don't have the substrates, there's no enhancement of oxidation, and there's also no, uh, there's just a, the normal replication process. If we do have the substrate, we do promote oxidation, and we get a faster rate of replication. So it shows there's this positive feedback, uh, or actually there are two positive, positive feedback loops, one associated with self-replication and the other one with um, with uh, uh, the, the proto-metabolism. So we can also do this um, proto-metabolism using a photocatalytic cofactor. Um, same trick there. So we have the replicator fibers able to recruit a dye that then converts triplet to singlet oxygen, which is a, much, uh, which is a good oxidant to convert thiols to disulfides. And also here, using this mechanism, uh, we can uh, promote uh, we get this positive feedback uh, on the formation of food for the replicator. So in a di completely different setting, now by cofactor recruitment, different chemistry, the same replicator, and that's important to realize, the same replicator um, can also uh, benefit uh, from a, uh, say, photometabolism. Um, so the same replicator can do the photocatalysis, it can do the FMOC cleavage, and it can do the retroaldo reaction. So the same structure. And then I think there is also some significance in this because in evolution, early on, you'd rather have as few replicators as possible to do as much catalysis as possible. So to have um, um, some promiscuity in catalysis is really an, an advantage. And it seems that these peptide-based systems can do this. Probably due to, and this is, this is only speculation at this stage, due to the fact that they're relatively heterogeneous in structure, that different microenvironments on the same fiber can potentially catalyze different reactions. Um, so how far have we come now? Um, I showed you we can do replication. I showed you we can do at least in part, or we can do this out of equilibrium. 
I showed you uh, a few examples that go towards uh, metabolism. We ha we haven't there's a sort of a grayed out tick mark here because we haven't captured the energy harvesting bit in metabolism. Um, so if you have any ideas how to implement this, um, please get in touch because we're uh, really interested in, in trying to develop that further. Um, I've also showed you at least that the rudimentary ingredients for Darwinian evolution, replication, mutation, selection uh, are covered. I did not talk at all about compartmentalization, even though we are working now quite hard to also implement this. And we have some ideas, but they're too early to share with you at this stage. Um, before I f finish, I'd like to um, return to the, the the statement I made before that we, for, we found our replicators by chance. Uh, so let me tell you the, the story um, as to why we were working with this type of molecule at the time. We were not targeting replicators, we were not even thinking replicators. What we wanted this molecule to do is make rings uh, that could then potentially bind some guests inside, and upon binding it would align the peptides such that you form beta sheets, and this beta sheet formation should then contribute to binding affinity. So that was the idea, that's why we worked on this. So we wanted, and basically we wanted the peptides to fold um, rather than to uh, to uh, within the same molecule rather than to replicate, which is what happens when you have interactions between peptides between different molecules. So we're targeting intramolecular interactions and we've got intermolecular interactions. Um, but now that we thought we understood replication, we started to explore also different structures. And here's another one. Here's one variant where we changed the peptide into uh, another structure containing a nucleo base. So the nucleo base, we thought in replication is a good thing to have. Who knows, we can do something with base pairing and with information transfer that way. So we're targeting now replication. Um, but I guess you feel it coming by now. Uh, the molecules had, uh, again, uh, uh, made up their mind in a different way. Uh, so we did not find replication, at least not in the first instance we now have. We actually published this now as well. But in the first instance, no replication. In the first instance, we got folding. And folding in a rather surprising way. Uh, so it shows, before I show you what the foldomer was, it shows that replication and folding in systems like this are two sides of the same coin. And it's what side the coin lands on depends on whether interactions turn out to be inter or intramolecular. So this is the case in our systems. But it's also the case much more generally. So assembling versus folding in nature is what, what leads proteins astray into amyloid fibers and gives things like Alzheimer's. So this is where proteins start to assemble, where non-covalent interactions forms intramolecularly rather than intermolecularly when it's in the proper folded native state. And even after billion years of years of evolution, nature hasn't quite worked out how to um, how to completely avoid falling into the uh, self-assembly trap um, with its proteins. But back to our foldomer. Um, so this was the structure again, uh, nucleobase, uh, single amino acid, the diethyl to form the rings. Um, this, much to our surprise, if you took, take this building block, put it in water, stir it for a while, neutral pH, uh, oxygen from the air, uh, what you get out is this chromatogram. So this is not after purification, this is the crude mixture and as far as you can call it crude. Uh, it's a 15 mer, so it's a ring of this size and only this ring. It doesn't form 14, it doesn't form 16. Uh, if you look carefully here, it's a little bit of four and three membered rings, but nothing big except 15. And it does selectively form 15 because it folds in a very specific conformation, just like proteins can fold. And it folds by stacking this ring on top of that ring, on top of that ring, on top of that ring, on top of this ring, in a a stack of five aromatic rings that you see here in the crystal structure that then gets repeated five times around the entire structure. So there's some there's a five-fold symmetry in this structure, um, but still a remarkable complexity and remarkable that something that as big as this forms. So this is the entire structure. Um, you really need to stare at it for a long time to see how it fits together and what interactions form. Um, so that was serendipitous. We were completely not expecting this folded structure to emerge. Can we now, knowing that this can occur, 
identify some design rules here. Can we go towards design of building blocks that make folded structures? Um, and the selection rule that exists in systems like this and in super molecular systems in general, you tend to form the smallest structure as in the small, fewest number of components that harvest most, if not all, of the possible non-covalent interactions. So in that selection rule, you should expect um, small rings to be preferred over large rings. So if you still want a large ring to form, nevertheless, you need to somehow selectively favor the large rings um, or frustrate the small ones. And that frustration is you can introduce by choosing choosing the right hydrophobic hydrophilic balance. That's that hydrophobic interactions can only form in the large ring efficiently, but not in the small rings. Um, and the other thing, if you want a specific large ring, so only 15 mer, not 14 and 16, you need also there to be big difference in stability between these different between these marginally different ring sizes. And that probably requires very specific directional interactions. So if you realize these things, you can start to think about how to design building blocks and how not to. Um, so a, good, a bad design would be this, where you have only small rings and not much hydrophobic interaction there. If you make um, a non, if you don't allow for, um, uh, if you make it less hydrophilic, but you don't allow for specific interactions, but just basically have something non-specific hydrophilic uh, attached to your building block, you can access large rings, really large rings, but there's no selectivity. The moment you start to introduce specific interactions like hydrogen bonding between these amides and maybe some uh, more specific hydrophobic interactions, you start now making also again large rings, a whole bunch of them, but no longer like this sort of a gradual smear but some selectivity starts to appear. If you want to become really selective, uh, you need to talk to Babish uh, because he's developed the intuition to do this um, very efficiently <clears throat> and in collaboration with Ivan Huck and Pradeep, uh, an Indian postdoc in his lab, who is a really master of growing crystals and solving the crystal structures. We now identify the whole family of these folded structures um, with different ring sizes um, that differ only in building block by the nature of this R group here. RSH, you get many large rings. Put a carboxylate, you get nine mers. Put a uh, guanidinium, you get 16 mers. Put an amine, you get 23 mers. Now we have even more ring sizes now, pretty much covering almost every number with one or two exceptions until 23. Uh, so 23 is still the largest. It's a prime number, low symmetry, Remarkable that it forms a foldomer. This is the core. If you only look at the crystal structure, uh, in only if in the crystal structure you only look at how these aromatic disulfides in the oxidized form uh, are oriented, this is how it looks. So I challenge you to detect symmetry here. Um, it's a low symmetry structure uh, from 23 identical before they started to oxidize identical building blocks. So this is the whole thing. Um, so, 1,334 atoms that in principle are all in unique environments is 11 kilodalton folded structure uh, coming out of a single, not too difficult building block containing two amino acids. I would never have believed this to be possible if we, if we just didn't see it with our own eyes. Um, again, this is the entire structure uh, for as far as the, um, the, the, the residues are not disordered. Um, so as you see, uh, it's, uh, it's got preciously little symmetry. So it seems like we've hit upon a class of molecules that share some similarities, but also some so quite some differences with amino acids that form proteins, folded structures in the form of proteins. So these, these uh, aromatic dithiols also form very specific, very well-defined secondary structures, uh, sorry, folded structures, uh, even as homomeric sequences. So you have identical, 23 identical building blocks already form a folded structure. You can't do that with amino acids. There's no single amino acid that has a compact folded structure, um, a globular folded structure by just repeats of itself. You need a more, uh, more sequence diversity. Um, it shows a remarkable variety of folds. Uh, so we have now many different ring sizes, more than I uh, have time to show. 
question is, can we make functional foldemers? Um, of course, proteins are interesting um, mostly because of what they do and maybe less so because of how they look. For the moment, we have largely things that look nice, but they don't do much. Can we make, but we know from proteins that folding is really key to function and an enabler of function. So can we do, uh, can we go towards foldemers that do things like um, bind molecules or maybe cooperate with replicators? I'll show you one, ex one uh, result and then I'll stop that shows that you can indeed obtain foldemers with function by adding a template to the system. So if you take this building block that makes a nimer by itself, and if you add sodium chloride to it, you see there is in the chromato chromatogram, there is a 12-membered 12 a 12 ring appearing. If you put manganese chloride, you get a lot more of it. If you put calcium chloride, you get 13-membered ring uh, arising. We've isolated these guys and run binding studies to show that indeed this is now got a binding site for calcium, or this, the, the ability to bind calcium from a one-to-one -one complex um, with about my millimolar affinity. So it's not a hugely efficient binder, but I think it's pretty cool that you can actually now template the formation of foldemers that have binding properties. Okay, here I should um, stop and I realize I'm already taking a lot of time, so let me skip the, the, the thinking bits and finish with the challenges we're currently working on. So I showed you um, replication. I didn't talk much about the fidelity of information transfer in replication, and we're currently working hard to see if we can uh, we can measure it and to see if we can improve it. Uh, for instance, by adding a proofreading step. Um, the other maybe biggest challenge in the synthesis, and certainly also in the origin of life, is how do you maintain your identity if you're a replicator and you're phasing a uh, 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 evolutionary space that you can involve into that is combinatorially diverse to the point that it explodes. That is the reality of chemistry, right? You leave chemistry to go, it becomes very, very quickly, very divergent. And yet, if you're a replicator, you better maintain your identity in that, in the face of that, otherwise you, you die. And that's a challenge. It has to do with error thresholds, it has to do with replication fidelity. Uh, we're working hard to see if we can we, we we can uh, we can understand this better and and allow also evolution in in a larger combinatorial diversity. How do you develop communities of cooperating replicators? Um, because that's also going to be important later on in evolution. I think life from very early on was an ecosystem. It was not a single um, Luca. It was a, an ecosystem. So Luca's last universal common ancestor, uh, as it's called. Uh, I don't personally believe that that's the right way of thinking about the origin of life. We can discuss that later if you want. And then how do you achieve open-ended evolution? Uh, it's really an open question. And how do you achieve catalytically active foldemers? It's also something we're really keen on uh, answering. There, I should really stop, but not before thanking the guys in the lab. This is the team some time ago uh, when we were still allowed to, when we were still allowed to go out and have fun. Uh, we now can only have fun in the lab on a respectable distance. Um, and these are the people that uh, that funded our work, um, for which I'm also really grateful that they keep funding the fundamental science that we're doing, and I hope they continue to do this for a little while longer. With that, I should thank you uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, to take any questions. Thank you, Sidren, for the fantastic lecture. Now, question and answer session. So, Officer Saminathan, please go ahead. Officer Saminathan, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, we can hear. Yes. We can hear you now. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, very impressive uh, work. I really enjoyed your talk. I have a couple of questions, if I may. Yeah, sure. Uh, as you know, life uh, began in the ocean, right? That's what it is said. And then sunlight had a big role in the life because uh, 
the earth was having the sunlight all the time and the sunlight has a periodicity of day and night so that could have played a big role in the evolution of life that is number 1 and the number 2 is the 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 earliest organisms the single celled organisms had a membrane enclosing them so these two components maybe have to incorporate in your model system would that make it little more lively that is my question thank uh, you yeah i think that that's a good point i think the ability to um well if you want to do evolution if you don't drive things um in different ways you need environment to change and doing this in a cyclic way like you have in a day night rhythm um could be one way of doing this um so yeah i think it's an it's it's an interesting uh, suggestion and certainly the idea of changing the environment uh, around is something that we already played with not necessarily um in the results i showed you it was just the solvent environment um we have now started to play around and i think that gets closer to your question uh, maybe not day and night but with weak and strong light so we have these photo redox catalysts that have a feedback on the efficiency of replication and uh, our latest results show that if you um that in different light regimes different replicators uh, prevail so that that if you uh, go from a uh, from uh, strong irradiation to weak irradiation uh, you go from one replicator to another um and um that is uh and, and that that also that same system it's still early days uh so i don't have the slides yet but in the same system we also have we we monitor we notice a feedback of the uh replicator on the subsequently on the environment uh, in that it changes the overall oxidation state of the environment um so we have strong irradiation making a replicator that then makes the uh, environment strongly uh, more oxidized uh, and that allows another replicator to emerge um so it as in a very small scale kind of some similarities to what what we've seen played out in the great oxygenation event on earth where life created changed its own atmosphere to the point that life had to had to change and adapt to it thank you Okay, Professor Javi Borua, please go ahead. Yeah, hello, Professor. This is Javi Borua. So I just say I just um, thank you for your kind, you know, talk, and it has been it is exciting. I have two points to ask you. See, one about the catalysis. When you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. See, when you are doing catalysis, see, you have had a induction time of ten hours, and you know you have put the component there. and what is actually what has happened uh, to the component during the tenors you why not you know you prepared the prepared the you know catalyst the that the first tenors induction time then put the you know do the reaction um yeah you could do this um so indeed if we're if you're after the synthetic use you you draw the first prepared catalyst and then put your substrate um the reason we did this experiment not in that way because it was because we wanted to show that the substrate doesn't interfere in the even in this catalyst synthesis or it's the, the self synthesis if you like of the catalyst so it's not that we need this 10 hour induction period to do the catalysis we might as well make the catalyst first and then add the substrate and then it immediately goes yeah my second question is that see you were talking about now making self assembly then the cu involved covalent synthesis as well as supramolecular synthesis now the covalent synthesis are you know many times becomes irreversible and you know it becomes you know uh, difficult to control but non covalent is uh, more you know more uh, rather you know easy to break and form now when you talk about really later self assembling procedure for replicas your methodologies will be good to, because of this competitive uh, environment will that be good i think the covalent interactions if we it would if it can be if it could have been minimized or you know some other guided because it's a sulfur sulfur bond that mm -hmm. is why it is happening 
and if you know and in other other cases it will not be possible probably you know if you have a carbon carbon bond c c and bond formation forming reactions your approach will be you know failing there um yeah so i think our approach does rely on the ability of molecules of these covalent bonds once formed to to basically unform again to break them again i think in life this is also what continuously happens, right? I mean, the lifetime of a protein inside our bodies is about an average 48 hours, and then it's actively broken down again, even though it's amides. And there you need strong, uh, very good catalyst because that doesn't happen by itself. But I think if you are after the, the synthesis of life and also in the origin of life, we, we should be looking for covalent bonds that are also, uh, that are not too stable. They should be cleavable again because you need this formation, destruction, and recycling of material all the time. Without it, um, I mean, if you make a rock solid covalent bond and it never gets destroyed again, it can never, I mean, material is locked away, can never be utilized further. Um, so I think the, um, we're in, in what we're doing when addressing the uh, synthesis of life, and I think also in the origin of life field, the focus should be on bonds that are relatively easily uh, hydrolyzable. And this is also why I mean, some people talk about the RNA world. And in many cases, the argument against it um, was that the RNA, RNA is so unstable. I find that's one of the most strong arguments in favor of it, although I don't necessarily agree with the RNA world. But I, that, that part I like. Um, uh, a lot that that, uh, that the bonds that held the molecules together are easily uh, reversed again. So we see it with isulfides. You, you can do it. The phosphodiester in RNA is uh, labile, and there's a handful of other labile bonds. But trying to generalize this out, looking for um, reactions, looking for reaction pairs, I should say, uh, where you can form a bond using one route and de degrade it and go back to where you came from using another. Those types of reaction pairs are remarkably rare. Um, maybe that helps us in our search for the origin of life because it does reduce down uh, the possibilities uh, quite dramatically. I was surprised to find how difficult it is if you want to do synthesis and destruction in the same pot under the same conditions how difficult it is to get that done, how few chemistries allow you to do it. Thank you. Thank you, best of luck, and all the best wishes for the, you know, making it total subject and, you know, with success. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Yes. Next, uh, Dr. Kanchala, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Swiss friend. Um, very nice talk. Uh, and, and very, very exciting and interesting topic as well. So uh, essentially, you have shown two classes of molecules. One is the replicators. The other is the foldimers, where the intramolecular and fragments are dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the first case, you have shown that the process of replication is sort of an autocatalytic process. Uh, in the second case, did you really observe if that is also sort of an autocatalytic by trying to seeding you know, using the seeding in technology, uh, where you yeah, manage to place a particular. So that is also an autocatalytic process, or yeah, of course we tried, but if, but but uh, we didn't expect it to be autocatalytic, and indeed it, it so far isn't. Um, I say so far because we did find one more system where we see the non-covalent assembly. It's, it's another surprise outcome. Uh, we found. And um, a foldimer that was composed of two almost identical uh, halves, so it's uh, like a quaternary complex. And there we're probing whether one half actually kind of chaperones the formation of the other, but we we don't know the outcome yet. Um, there there might be some form of self-promotion, but for the the ones that I showed you, for the simple well, call them simple for the for the in individual rings, um, they are not autocatalytic as far as we can tell. Um, and we are, very, but we're very intrigued to find out exactly how they form because um, they've, some of them are remarkably fast to form. 
uh, to the point that you barely see in any intermediates. You see the monomer disappearing and you see the foldomer forming. Um, right. and, and that uh, that means there must be some, some kinetic pathway that is particularly easy to, to, uh, to follow. And we'd love to find out what it is. Yeah, uh, the other question that, I, yeah, I mean, you, you, I think probably still have to probe to understand exactly the mechanism behind this. The other question that I have is, well, first of all, this is really interesting from the perspective of peptides as well, where, you know, the folding of the protein is mainly dependent on these disulfide linkages and you're sort of exploring the same thing, you know, to get this kind of systems chemistry. Uh, but the thing that I, I'm interested in is like most of your systems are limited to this one three, you know, uh, diethyol okay. thing. You know, why okay. did you try the other uh, one four diethyol or one two diethyol and see what what sort of replications do those systems do, or why is it limited to one three? Um, whether it's limited, we don't know yet. But our, of course, we did try a few other things. Um, and uh, um, in one case, actually, that predates even the the, the one three diethyl on the naphthalene uh, two six di substituted naphthalene. We also get self assembly driven um, uh, self replication um, of of a different type of uh, of a four membered ring. Um, so it's not limited. Um, but having said that, it seems like we can put pretty much anything on our. 1,3 diethyl, and we can get a replicator. Whereas for the other things we tried, uh, this is much harder. Um, okay. I this might have something to do with the way the 1,3 diethyl derived rings can pack yeah, into probably. a stack. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I, that, yeah that might just be, be be very nice uh, mm -hmm. arrangement to, to allow to do the allow you to do this. Um, but we are now exploring also. Other diethyls, um, but as I said, with if we may, if we modify that part of the structure, um, finding replicators is suddenly a lot harder, and we can touch pretty much. I mean, we can modify the peptide to an to a nuclear base, even to a bit of ethylene oxide, and we can still get cell replication. Um, so there, it seems much more forgiving. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dr. Dibendu, please go ahead. Hey, Ziben, this is Dibendu from Isaac Kolkata. Hi, hey. Dibendu, how are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Fascinating talk, I must say. So, uh, a quick question regarding this simple replicator and the complex replicator. If you go to this energy diagram uh, mm -hmm. kindly, so, so this uh, reduction pr process is. So this reduction process is leading to this. Uh, so would you call this uh, this five member ring uh, as a, uh, obviously it's not non equilibrium, but it's not dissipative, right? Is it dissipative? Yeah, absolutely. So you mm -hmm. you uh, so the, the I mean this only works as long as you keep fueling it with the oxidant and the reductant. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the, if you stop fueling, we've done this experiment. So if you, if you stop fueling. So with fueling, you arrive and you populate this state. You mm -hmm. stop fueling, and in no time you're back here. So if I stop fueling, okay, okay. At some point, uh, after you get the population, still you come back to the uh, trimer. Yeah. After you get a finite number, okay, I see, I see. Really cool. A second uh, question would be regarding that folding, uh, that uh, nuclear base, uh, and uh, that structure with Bobby's uh, that paper. So, mm -hmm. did you try with installing with some lysine or a histidine, uh, say, best of two worlds, where you have folded structure and lysine in them so that they can do some catalysis? Um, with the nuclear base, we did uh, not, but with the peptides, um, let's see if uh, there is a lysine. <laughs> okay, there. Okay. Um, but so far, and we've we've been playing around with this um, quite a lot now. So far, no luck with catalysis. It's quite surprising that where the it's kind of the the world upside down, right? So in nature, you have things that do replication that that are used to store genetic information that are being replicated, RNA and DNA, and RNA can catalyze things, but it's not so good as proteins. 
Here we have replicators that seem to be way better <laughs> at catalyzing reactions than the polymers, which are more like the, in, in structure like the proteins. Um, so we're this, trying to scratch our head as why that is, why the folded structures that are more protein-like in the way they look are not really, even if they have the same amino acid residues, are not doing what the uh, catalysis in, uh, so far pretty much at all, whereas the replicators with similar, build, similar peptides do. And it might have something to do that the foldomers do succeed in burying all hydrophobic stuff inside, where the rep, whereas the replicators have beta sheets that still uh, expose a lot of hydrophobic pockets to the outside world. That's so our theory more, right now. They're more plastic, I would say, and the folded structures are more rigid, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's also might very well be be behind this because also indeed the. The, the dynamicity of the, the um, um, I think the foldomers are deep energy wells. The, mm -hmm. the replicators are, are just, are, are, they're selected to be just able to self-assemble, but not necessarily very good at it. Um, so the foldomers are the amyloid uh, structures in a way, in an altered world, right? <laughs> no, the, the, the replicators are, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I see it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the world upside down, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, there is a question from Sumit Choudhury. He's asking, what are the concentration and the oxidizing condition for ring formation? Um, water pH, well, pretty much neutral or a little bit basic, 8.2 two or so, but seven would also work, and oxygen from the air and stir. Uh, so the concentration, millimolar to mid-micromolar, so 20, 20 micromolar, we can still get the immersion of replicators. It's pretty robust, actually. Even You can play around with the pH, um, co-solvent. Uh, if you're not too much organic, it's fine. So it's remarkably... Uh, certainly the replicators are remarkably robust and some of the foldomers, uh, in fact, also. Any more question? Hey, hi. Um, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Shovik from Isaac, Kolkata. Um, a very nice, very nice talk and very fascinating work. Uh, I'm an undergrad student at Isaac, so I have this uh, um, I have this um, question regarding the stochastic environment that you try to create in a little um, mm -hmm. uh, little systems where you try to maintain the condition prior to like almost same and check check how the population varies right here. So mm -hmm. you make it in different files, right? Now, why can't you, uh, uh, is it possible to do in a continuous steel re uh, reactor where I input these two mix, so A and Y, and uh, over time I check the population and look at the dynamics of how I varying the one concentration and the other and how the dynamics change. And in a continuous steel reactor, it's more like a, you know, out of, out of equilibrium cell mimic or something like that. Yeah. So is it possible to do it? Yeah, it, it should be. I mean, technically, for sure. Um, I would expect that what happens is that you you take, I mean, if, if you set it up in, in the conditions that this experiment was set up, you, you then arrive more or less stochastically at a certain, at either six or eight membered ring that's a, that's a, that prevails. And, um, and it will, once that has a head start, it's very hard for the other guys to, uh, or the other guy, the other ring size to catch up. Um, but of course, if you start to bias, and I think we've done some experiments here with building block ratio, that if you go for one building block, it's more wants to make the eight membered ring and the other more the six membered. So that if you start to bias composition, you will you will push it eventually. It would be my expectation to to one and, and uh, one predominant ring size that's also predictable. So you'd lose, I guess, some of the stochasticity. Um, but yeah, you'd maintain it out of equilibrium. That's that's uh, that is the uh, the positive side. 
ओके ओके एंड अनदर क्वेश्चन इज दैट हाउ इन द इन द एफएम वीडियो दैट यू हैव शोन एंड देयर इज अ सबस्ट्रेट ट्रांसफरिंग फ्रॉम लाइक फ्रॉम द सेल्फ असेंबल स्टेट लाइक देयर इज सम सबस्ट्रेट एकुमुलेशन देन ट्रांसफरिंग टू अनदर लाइक अ ब्रांचिंग शॉट ऑफ हैपेंस ओवर टाइम लाइक हाउ यू आर कंफर्मिंग दैट दैट there is some augmentation on the top like how in mechanistically how it is uh, going on can you shed light on that uh, we we love to be able to um um we we have some we we suspect some things are happening at the fiber end um we're trying to probe that now with kinetic with, with a bit of modeling and 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 experiment combining modeling and experimental data um if i have to make a guess but we don't have enough evidence to really back it up is that what happens is that material diffuses uh, along the fiber I mean, that we know material diffuses and in, in, indeed accumulates at the fiber ends if you do the statistics on these a lot of these videos this is this is what clearly happens and that at the fiber ends you probably get a active catalysis with the conversion of small rings into large rings that constitute the fiber and we have some indication as to how what, what actually is the activation step there in that if you look at how a small ring binds at the fiber end that is constituted of large rings is it starts to impose strain on the disulfide bond so you get disulfide torsional angles in md simulations that is you get disulfide torsional angles that are kind of unhappy they're strained so that means that must mean those bonds are more readily breakable than an ordinary disulfide and that's what you need to do in order to convert a small ring to a big ring that's our current theory uh, we have some support as i said from molecular dynamics uh, we'd love to have some more direct experimental evidence for this it's hard to obtain it's hard to design an experiment that really catches this yeah that's actually very cool it looks like a uh, you know molecular walker transporting some uh, substrate from one side to another Yeah, it seems to be directional. So the yeah, statistics yeah. shows that it it, it look, that it wants to go in one direction. So we're trying to find out uh, why that is. Also, molecular dynamics actually shows it. So maybe a macro dipole effect or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's interesting, and also because it's it's functional, right? It's uh, it's, it's the transporting something for for uh, that that actually benefits the system. thanks a lot uh, that's very educative thank you thanks so so enzyme that does bind like that also uh, it attracts the surface ribbon to again ribbon yep so in, enzyme binds like that also you think that it doesn't the substrate doesn't go directly to the to the active site and goes to the surface and then crawls itself to the active site who knows Some it's an interesting yeah. it's an interesting hypothesis and i wouldn't be surprised if some enzymes would make use of this to uh, to get to their substrates more quickly because if you think about it if you can if you as an enzyme can actually utilize every collision with you not only exactly. collision active site mm-hmm. that should, you should you should benefit i mean that should be good so that evolution found a way of doing this um on the other hand um Yeah, it will be interesting. Actually, I, I, it's a good thought. I haven't really talked to uh, to enzymologists about this, um, but maybe we should, and people should start looking as to whether this is a uh, a more general uh, mechanism than, uh, than than we see here. And uh, but the cool thing, I mean, what what what? So we'd never, we would never have found out. Well, that's maybe too strong. Um, it would have taken us a lot longer to realize that this happened if we couldn't, if we hadn't just seen it. so seeing chemistry like here uh, even though resolution is still very crude um is so powerful so i'm really looking forward to further developments in in techniques like this where uh, we can start to see more details in real time mm-hmm. of molecules doing what molecules do right and <clears throat> so if there are no further question let us thank sijwen for the fantastic lecture and interesting discussions thank you my pleasure thanks for listening
Okay, so hope you will visit us when you feel free. Then you please contact us. And then we can meet in person here in IIT Guwahati. Yeah, if there are still any airline companies that are not bankrupt by then, then uh, we can <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and giving this fantastic lecture. Our students and colleagues got benefited and they learned also this new chemistry, I think. So thank you again and goodbye. Bye-bye. Good evening. Good.